Hello, everyone. Welcome to From Stands College Football Game Day Show. It is week 14, a.k.a. Conference Championship Week. And joining me again for the 14th time, we have Tom Scavetta, Andy Hopper. Uh, Andy, how's it going over there? Uh, it'd be going a lot better if the Big Ten actually respected Chase Brown. Leaving him off of the first team all Big Ten offense is a fucking joke. Absolutely atrocious. No disrespect to Corum or Mo Ibrahim, but this guy outgained them uh, in rushing yards, led the Power Five in rushing yards, uh, led the country in rushing yards from week zero to week 12, um, was absolutely the reason this team won eight games, uh, over 100 plus yards in all but two games this year, had more receiving yards, um, more scrimmage yards than either of those two guys um, by almost 200 plus yards. Um, just absolutely fucking atrocious. How is he a Doak Walker Award finalist, but not first team all conference? Make it fucking make sense. Other than that, a uh, ton of a ton of uh, all Big Ten uh, honorees for Illinois. Not something we're used to. Uh, and a couple guys. So Chase Brown, Devin Witherspoon, and uh, defensive coordinator Ryan Walters all up uh, for national awards. That's not something we see here in Champaign very often. So. Um, yeah, fuck, fuck the Big Ten for snubbing Chase Brown, but give him the Doak Walker Award. Yeah, I did see it. you sent that in the group chat. Uh, Illinois had more. What was it more? Uh, more uh, finalists for the national awards than Bama right. and Georgia combined. So Will Anderson Jr. is up for an award, and Stetson Bennett is up for an award. Uh, other than that, I don't believe there are any other uh, Georgia or Alabama players. That was a tweet from Tom Fornelli. Shout out Tom Fornelli. Gotcha. Uh, Tom, how's it going over there? I know you're a little bit sick. Yeah, I'm hanging in there, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm probably a little bit sick from Saturday night's loss to USC. <laughs> first time in over 2,000 days. Brian, uh, essentially, unofficially guaranteeing a Notre Dame went on last week's show. Um, oh, broke my heart. I mean, we all saw it coming, though. I mean, this is this is the Heisman favorite we're going up against in Caleb Williams. Uh, outstanding game, but... Um, Shit, man, it just sucks that Notre Dame doesn't get to play in a conference title game. You know, that, that's what sucks. Like, after this week, our season's done. We, we just wait for the bowl game now and figure out if we'll get a New Year's Six or not. So, uh, we'll see. We will see. That is the uh, the double-edged sword of being independent. But we might talk about that uh, a little later in our segment coming up. But first, we'll jump very quickly into a uh, weekly recap. Uh, all the games are set this week because there's only conference championship games. But, uh, Andy... What games from this past week uh, were shocking or uh, in your eye were, were a great watch? Um, shock, I mean, the shock factor, it, it was there for a couple games. Um, new Auburn head coach Hugh Freeze really going out in a blaze of glory uh, with Liberty. <laughs> new, Mex <laughs> new Mexico State comes in, wins 49-14. to 14. Just absolutely unbelievable. Jerry Kill has the Aggies bowl eligible. Their waiver from the NCAA uh, has been approved. Uh, they're five and six. They had a game earlier this year get canceled. They tried to schedule another FBS opponent, uh, but they were playing FCS uh, Valpo uh, on Saturday, I believe, in, in an attempt to get to six and six. Um, other than that, Michigan over Ohio State. Obviously, that's the big one there. Uh, I don't think it's as shocking. I think the way they won maybe may have shocked um, uh, people a little bit. You know, obviously forty-five to twenty-three. So that's a two-score win on the road. Uh, excuse me, that's a three-score win on the road. Jesus, I can't even do math. Um, now, now two in a row for the Wolverines. They're the favorites to win the conference championship this week against Purdue. Um, they are going to be without Blake Corum for the rest of the year. Yep. Um, but this Edwards guy is not too bad, <laughs> folks. He's averaging <laughs> seven and a half yards per carry. Keep an eye out for him. Obviously, their offensive line has just been outstanding all year. South Carolina over Clemson. Um, they get two ranked wins in a row, two top 10 wins in a row for South Carolina and Spencer Rattler. Um, Georgia Tech was up like 10 to nothing on Georgia for a little bit. That was fun. <laughs> um, Oregon State over Oregon. Other than that, man, I don't know. It was it was a really great weekend of college football. Uh, and I'm obviously, we, this is what we watch for, right? To get to this conference championship week, but it's also a little depressing because it means there's just less and less football to watch. Um, but Great week, couple shocking games. Um, excited for this weekend. What about you, Tom? Got anything uh, else that Andy didn't check off the list there? Um, checking off my list. How about airing out my dirty laundry? <laughs> um, the over not hitting for SMU Memphis. Uh, after all of us guaranteed it would happen, all three of us said the exact same thing. The over is hitting for that game, and it did not hit. Uh, I believe it missed by one point. In fact, um, you know, welcome to real life, everybody. Um, I, I mean, we can't say enough about those cocks. 
The Cox have had a fantastic season. Uh, Spencer Rattler, 360 passing yards. That really, really impressed me. Uh, proud to say that Clemson is officially eliminated from the college football playoff, even, even though I think our team should take the credit for doing that because, <laughs> hell, we lost to Marshall. So if you if you do the math, Marshall's better than Clemson. Not really. You get the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> um, also, Cade McNamara is transferring. <laughs> J.J. McCarthy earning the starting job long-term at Michigan. Where's McNamara going to go? That's where I want to know. Maybe he, he announced it. Did you see it? Yeah, minutes minutes ago, almost like an hour. He ago. announced. It. Yeah, he's going to Iowa. Oh, I was live. He's going to Iowa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, that's an upgrade over uh, Schitzer Petrus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Brian Ferentz is ecstatic that he has someone who actually can throw the ball decently now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I, I mean, you guys covered pretty much all the games I wanted to cover, except for my boys, uh, the Golden Knights here. That last second <laughs> touchdown against USF. I sent a clip to Tom because I know he's a tight end guy. Everyone watching by now should know he's a tight end guy. Uh, I mean, I don't want to toot our own horn, but that definite catch of the year candidate at the very least. I've never seen a tight end twist and turn so much uh, and barely get that toe in uh, before his knee hit out of bounds. So that was, I mean, we shouldn't have been within one score of USF anyways, uh, but a win's a win, so I'll take it. We're in the conference championship game this week. Uh, like you guys said, Oregon State over Oregon. Bo Nix going to Bo Nix. Uh, and then, yeah, Spencer Rattler, just super impressive. We dogged on the guy all year. And he finishes the season with uh, back-to-back top 10 wins. So mighty, mightily uh, impressive of, of the Cox. Maybe the most impressive impressive Cox we've seen uh, in the last 10 years, I will say. Uh, that, that'll move us into our first segment, Stop and Smell the Roses. Uh, we have a double dose of news coming out of the Rose Bowl. Uh, they have approved a 12-team playoff. And there's also some rumblings as in terms of who they will or will not take uh, in their game this year. So Tom, we'll start with you. Let's go with the new 12 team uh, announcement first because we've been talking about that all year uh, i think everyone wanted it we talked kind of about the rules what the new setup would be it seems like we got everything that we asked for which is very rare so uh what are your thoughts on the rose bowl a giving this a green light and b waiting until pretty much the very last uh moment before this would have locked in a 14 playoff for like another five years pretty crazy timing right pretty pretty crazy <laughs> timing to think about it that next year will be the last year of a 14 playoff I mean, that's pretty much what this solidifies, no? So the fact that it took the Rose Bowl to I, – I, I, I guess the Rose Bowl carries a lot of weight in these types of decisions and whatnot. Uh, I, I don't fully grasp it, but as far as the 12-team playoff goes, the fact that it's happening in two years, um, the fact that my boys won't be able to get a first-round buy ever until they join a conference – um, it, it ruins the beauty of being an independent school. So screw the 12 team playoff. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, look, it, it's, it's an advantage for all of these, uh, you know, middle of the pack schools, like, you know, Brian, like a UCF now their, their odds increase and the Illinois odds would increase as well. And hell our odds would increase because normally we're either the four or like the five or six during most years. That's usually how it goes with Notre Dame, but, um, uh, I like it. It's interesting with the timing, but, um, you know, I'm glad an agreement's been done because I think it'll make the playoff more exciting rather than having to wait weeks for two games and another one on Monday night. It's like, well, everyone's checked out of college football. And then once these playoff games rolls around, it seems like a lot of people are still checked out. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, you want to keep people locked in and I just think it would be really good for the NCAA to put this through, and I'm glad it's been done. Yeah, what are your thoughts, Andy? Uh, like I said, we kind of got everything that we chatted about earlier in the year. Uh, we get at large, or sorry, the six conference champion, champions get auto qualified. Uh, we get first round buys for the top four, which personally that was one I didn't like, but it's we'll take it here. Uh, but maybe most importantly, uh, we get first rounds on campus here. Uh, so are, are you are you loving this? What's what's going on here? Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I'm loving it, Brian. Come on, first. I mean, these. I mean, we've talked with every time we talk about this. I this is what I bring up first is these first round playoff games at these campus sites are going to be insane. Going to be absolutely insane. I Tom, I too, I had no idea that the Rose Bowl was the one holding it up, <laughs> or they like had this much power to deny it. I I, I guess. Um. But, I mean, I'm super happy to see this go through. Um, 2024 will be exciting for sure. Uh, like you said, I mean, it just opens it up for for, for more teams. They, they, 
I want to say it, it'll give the illusion that more teams have a shot because I think at the end of the day, uh, we still will see the four best teams uh, going through. Um, we'll see, but I mean, I love it. I, I think it's something that's been a long time coming. Uh, you look at what the FCS does with their playoff format. Uh, that's had a ton of success. Uh, why not the FBS? Yeah, and to both your points, I uh, thirdly <laughs> did not at least understand why the Rose Bowl had so much pull. Yeah. But the the reason was in the contracts, um, new contracts. Like I said, this is very like eleven fifty nine midnight type of situation where if the Rose Bowl said no, I think by the end of this week, then we were getting four teams. But in the previous contract, uh, the Rose Bowl had a special requirement to keep its traditional New Year's Day slot at two p.m. Uh, so I guess you know a little bit of money, uh, TV contract stuff going on, um, and the new contract, which would begin in twenty twenty six, they demanded it initially. And they have now rescinded it uh, in order to get this through. So my guess is the proposal from every other conference and every other big game was like, hey, this is the type of money that you'll be seeing. And it's probably higher. Rose Bowl said, cha-ching, doesn't really matter anymore about the time slot. Um, although I don't understand why they'll probably get a very similar, if not the same time slot most years anyway. So uh, not a big deal uh, in terms of that. And then the second news we have coming out of the Rose Bowl is that they may not take Ohio State. Uh, they have the not obligation, but the first uh, bid rights to the top Big Ten team, which is Ohio State, who has finished at number five. Um, but they are strongly considering taking number eight Penn State uh, as a sort of mutual agreement here between Ohio State and the Rose Bowl itself. Uh, Tom, we'll start with you. This is, at least in my recent memory, for this big of a game, the first time I can remember a swap being allowed uh, of this caliber. This would send Ohio State likely to the Orange Bowl. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think this is something that should maybe be expanded in some part. Um, I've talked before. I don't really like the conference tie-ins too much. So you come from a fandom of a bigger team who plays these teams who have the tie-ins. So what are your thoughts here uh, with what's going on in, the, in this potential swap? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of change like this, to be honest. Um, I, I think the Rose Bowl, the, the whole name of the event itself this thing should be hyped up. You want to get the best teams in there. Now, granted, I know they really want Penn State, who both lost, who lost to both Ohio State and Michigan this year. Those were their only two losses. So, you know, you still get an elite college football program in there, but um, I would much prefer to see Ohio State in this game. I don't know if this swap um, would realistically become like a long-term thing. Hopefully this is only like a, a rental. Um, I, I don't see the the purpose of potentially putting Ohio State in the Orange Bowl, um, other than to mix things up. Uh, again, I don't know if there's contracts or negotiations involved in this that you know the public eye may not know about. But for me personally, um, I think the Rose Bowl is looking ahead and telling us, "Hey, guys, Ohio State's not making the college football playoff this year," <laughs> especially after that performance against Michigan, though. But I guess to answer the question, Brian, uh, not in love with the idea. Just that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's where I stand with this issue. I, I would like to see Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, um, especially if they don't make the CFP. All right, Andy, what's it, what's your take here? Your, it's, yeah, it's so your conference. It is my conference, so that is, that, that's just weird to me because it's always been, you know, the the highest ranked Big Ten team versus you, you go out there and you play the it's big, it's always Big Ten Pac twelve. So it, it's not that that formula wouldn't change in this situation. Um, cause it would still be a big 10 team, but it not the, you know, not the big dog. Um, I guess from, from going over the article, what I'm kind of taking from it is, you know, the ro they're, they're trying to, I guess, trying to avoid a re a repeat performance in, in right. the Rose bowl. Cause I mean, obviously Ohio state it's pretty similar situation as last year, they lose to Michigan, uh, and, uh, they miss out. Uh, and that kind of, I mean, it happened again. It's not kind of happening again. Um, but I, I guess the Rose Bowl officials, they're also if, – if they they're, – they're trying to go for what they think is a better game. So I guess they're – in their minds, Ohio State beating the shit out of Washington isn't good for them. They'd rather bring uh, Penn State out and hoping it'll be a, a closer contest. Um, I don't love the idea. I, I guess – so if Ohio State was – who would they play in the Orange Bowl? Um, so the way it would work out, uh, I mean, assuming – the current rankings, you know, pretty much stay where they are, is that um, Ohio State would go down to the Orange, which would bump Tennessee from the Orange to the Cotton Bowl, and they would Ohio State would likely play Clemson in the Orange. And we're trying to avoid repeat 
performances. Ohio State <laughs> played Clemson very recently um, in, albeit that wasn't the college football playoff. But, I mean, they're, they're going to do whatever they think, like, they're going to do whatever the ratings, dick, like, whatever they think the highest ratings will be and whatever, however they can make the most money, um, in, in my opinion. But I, this is very interesting. It's not something uh, you see happen too often. I don't um Maybe they're thinking Penn State's going to have less guys opt out of a meaningless bowl game uh, than Ohio State might. Um, I don't know. But I guess if you want to take something positive away from it, they, they're they really concerned with the product on the field. It does sound like these uh, the Tournament of Roses officials want they want a competitive game. They want something compelling that people will actually watch. So uh, I didn't want to stop you right there because it was funny to listen to what you said. It is exactly the last reason that you said. Um, that Penn State, the early rumblings coming out of uh, their team or administration, the leaks, I guess, by the reporters, is that if this does go through and Penn State does go to the Rose Bowl, none of the players want to opt out. So um, to me, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to see how long this negotiation between Ohio State and the Rose Bowl has been going on. Um, if it happened, like, right after the game or if this, you know, they let it simmer a little bit and they're like, you know, what, we don't want to do this again. Let's see if we can mix things up. But I, it, see, it's so weird because you guys come from bigger teams and bigger conferences. For me, you know, UCF is still, we've had a few good seasons. We're still very small, despite the fact that we have like the second most students in the entire nation. As a footballing school, we're very small. We're very new. So kind of like how you guys were saying, I don't understand how the Rose Bowl has so much pull. To me, I don't understand why the tie-ins have so much pull. Um, I would just want to see the best games. I think the Rose Bowl and Ohio State, the fact that it's mutual and I mean, they, they probably know the fans aren't going to travel. This is, let's let's be honest, a disappointing outcome for this season for them. They thought they were going to the playoff. Now they're not, and they're looking at another Rose Bowl, um, which is a place they didn't want to be. I mean, that sounds ridiculous to say, but, you know, it's usually playoff or bust for, for a team like that. So I can kind of understand where, the, where both sides are coming from. I think it would be terrible optically if Ohio State went, none of their fans traveled, and then the shots in the stands was half-empty stadium. Uh, we see that with pretty much every team out of California. There's just no fans there. So I think the Rose Bowl just looked at this. Penn State has a great fan base uh, that loves to travel. So uh, it's mutually beneficial. And I don't know, I, I personally would like to see more of it in the future. I know both of you guys probably uh, are on the other side of that coin. But, uh, you know, if we get if we get more mix-ups in, in the future, I would love to see it. That's going to move us into our shots and chasers for conference championship game week. In our first slot, we have a little bit of an uh, overnight situation going here. If you want to uh, party through the night, stay awake for the noon game. Uh, starting at Friday night, 8 p.m., we have a team we talked about earlier, USC. Uh, they're in that top four spot now, taking on Utah, the only team they've lost to this season. Andy, we'll start with you. Is Utah getting it done again and ruining the Pac-12's chance at a playoff spot, or is Caleb Williams uh, going to bring it home here? Uh, Utah's head coach said they're looking forward to playing spoiler uh, in this game and coming in with the chip on their shoulders and looking to kind of you know ruin USC's season. Uh, really knocked them out of playoff contention. Tom talked about him earlier. Caleb Williams, uh, just give this guy the Heisman. He has <laughs> been playing on another level this year. Um, this is going to be this home game for USC, right? Or is it in Vegas? Yeah, this is in Allegiant Stadium in Vegas. Le okay, it's in. Okay, I didn't remember because didn't the Pac-12 used to do it at the higher seeds home field? Or am I making that up? I can't remember now. Now that Vegas has their claws in it. Nah, yeah, of course, of course. Awesome. Um, anyway, going back to this game, I'm going to take USC. I think they get revenge on Utah. I think they put the pressure on the committee to put them in. Um, and I mean, credit Lincoln Riley for what he's been able to do in year one. Um, every time we talk about USC, I, I have to bring up Caleb Williams and Jordan Addison because they've just been awesome to watch this year. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the Trojans here. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to be shocked if Utah wins this game because this is absolutely what Utah does. They just ruin... Um, the higher seeded teams' chances in their conference. Like, it seems like once a year. Uh, Tom, what's your take here? Well, Andy brought up something very important uh, Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams, right? USC didn't have that last year. Um, now they do, which is part of the reason why their offense averages over 500 yards a game. Who could keep up with that? Utah can keep up with that. If you guys remember, the one loss they had this year was against Utah. That was in Mormon Central. Brian McArdle predicted this game correctly, saying that the Utes would beat the Trojans, and they did win by a final score of 43-42. to 42. Uh, Cameron Rising needs to keep up with Caleb Williams if the Utes are going to have a shot. I mean, the guy has 28 total touchdowns on the season, if you include rushing statistics, and the Utes love to run the rock. 
Uh, you know, 34 rushing touchdowns. And I will say this, they do have the better tight end of this game as well. That's always important. Uh, Dalton Kincaid with eight touchdown receptions, future NFL player, hopefully, um, you know, a day one draft deck would be nice to see. But defensively, I look at what the Utes have. Van Fillinger leads that defense. Real Phillips, the first problems. He has six interceptions on the season. Um, you know, he caused problems for Kim Williams in the last meeting. Uh, when I look at USC, I obviously look at Caleb Williams. 44 total touchdowns, 10 on the ground, too. I mean, hell, we couldn't stop this guy for a rat's ass last week. Uh, no no Travis Dye, no problem. Austin Jones is the new lead there, 609 yards and five touchdowns. And then you have a plethora of receiving weapons with Jordan Addison, future pro, Taj Washington, and Mario Williams. And then I love saying this guy's name every week because he just continues to impress and he deserves to be mentioned. Tui Tula Pulotu with 12 and a half sacks on the season. And then uh, their corner, Caleb Bullock, with five picks. So both teams have solid defenses. Uh, USC's is slightly better. Uh, I might be going slightly mad here, no pun intended, when I make this game prediction. But uh, I'm going to go with the Trojans like Andy, unfortunately. If you beat Notre Dame, it's tough to beat a team twice, guys, especially in the same conference in the same season. They're not playing in Utah this time around. And they only survived by one point. This is different now. USC. Yeah, I mean, like the way I put it during the last time that they met, uh, I talked about the thin air kind of in a joking manner, but it, it is no joke. And they're not there anymore. They're inside not just a regular stadium in a neutral site. They're in a dome stadium that doesn't even have turf because they have that uh, the little pull-out tray uh, thing going on, the big money that they spent there in Vegas. So they're playing on natural grass inside. It's not going to be cold. Don't have that Utah air. So it is a completely different uh, environment here. This game is... So important for the Pac-12. They haven't had a playoff team in five seasons, which is just absurd that, you know, since we've moved to four teams, you can't get a, at least one every other year. Um, should be a decent shot, especially, you know, going up against the Big 12, who's kind of in the same level of play. Um, but yeah, it's, I really want Utah to win this game again. But Caleb Williams has just looked so good, even in the absence uh, of Travis Dye, despite the, the absence of Travis Dye, I should say. Uh, he's a man at hour right now. He's got 44 total touchdowns, probably the Heisman lead, probably clinches it if he wins this game, I think for sure. Uh, he's had plenty of Heisman moments and everyone else has kind of fallen off. Uh, but it's still going to be a fight. This is Pac-12's top scoring offense going up against its number one defense. So Utah is no slouch on the other side of the ball. They're top 20, total yards allowed, rushing yards allowed, and points allowed. What's the missing part of the puzzle though? Passing yards allowed, which is where Caleb Williams has been eating everyone up. So him and Jordan Addison, if they can get going early, this could be a lot of trouble, and like Tom said, Cam Rising is going to literally have to keep up because if this gets into another shootout, I think the advantage this time is with USC. 43 to 42, we might see an identical scoreline here. Um, the one thing I do want to see, Tommy brought him up, and I'm going to butcher his name, Tuli Tui Uh He does lead the nation in sacks, but I'm going to say something entirely ridiculous here, and that is that USC struggles with QB pressures. They have 35 sacks a season, which is one of the best in the nation. But against the only three ranked teams they played, uh, UCLA, Utah, and Notre Dame, they average just one per game. So this is going to be a very telling battle of whether that D-line is actually very good or whether they just ate up on the cupcakes and they can't get it done against the big boys. Um, because I think they got one sack against you guys last week, maybe two. Um, but notably, the last time they played Utah, big goose egg, zero sacks of Cam Rising. So uh, unfortunately, I'm going with the Trojans as well. I like how we all picked them and were disappointed in the pick. Um, <laughs> but they, they just look really good. Uh, and then moving into Saturday at noon, we have the Battle of the Purple Teams. TCU taking on Kansas State. TCU also in that top four looking to hold on to a playoff spot. Uh, Andy, are the Horned Frogs holding on here to that top four? Or is uh, Kansas State going to pull a little bit of an upset here? Um, I don't know. I mean, so you look at what TCU's done this year. Obviously, they're 12-0. and um, They've done it with super, like, I believe, what, number one strength of record? Um, super... Uh, highly rated strength of schedule as well. Um, I've talked about Max du Max Duggan ad nauseum <laughs> on this show and uh, how high I am on this kid. Uh, but you can't sleep on Kansas State. Uh, you look at them coming into the number 10 team in the country. They are 9-3. and three. They're the highest rated team with three losses uh, this season. Um, and, and they have been really solid. Uh, they're on a three-game winning streak themselves. Uh, they've scored 40-plus in their last two games. This is an offense that can keep up. With the Horn Frogs, uh, both teams come in averaging over 30 points a game. Um, both are 
throwing uh, over 400 yards a, a game. They both go 200 plus on the ground. We are going to see some explosive offense. The total for this game has been set at 62. Um, I'm taking the over. I'm also taking TCU, but I think it's going to be a lot closer. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a nail biter. I think this one comes down to the wire, but I'm going with TCU. I love, I, I love a good. Well, they're not really a. They're like a small school, but they're in a power conference. I like. Uh, you don't see TCU making the playoff very often. I'm going to go for them to go 13 and 0 and make the playoff. All right, Dom. Yeah, guys, let's be realistic here. TCU is this year's Cincinnati. That's what they are. Um, this game's being played in Texas. TCU is from Texas. They will have somewhat of an, an advantage there. Uh, but when I look at the Wildcats, they have a slightly better defense. They have three players with three interceptions. Felix Anuriki Uzoma with seven and a half sacks on the season. And then Brendan Mott with six sacks in his own right. Now, this is what concerns me with Kansas State, a quarterback play a little bit. Will Howard's not a bad quarterback by any stretch, but he's not Max Duggan. Um, what Kansas State needs to do to have success is establish Deuce Vaughn early, right? Deuce Vaughn has rushed for 1,300 yards this season. They need to lean on him and keep Max Duggan and that TCU offense off the field. But we know Sonny Dykes has a game plan. You know, great. he ran a great system at SMU that got him this job. And again, he mentioned Max Duggan, 3,000 passing yards, 29 touchdowns to just three interceptions, five on the ground. And these two teams met earlier this year. TCU won that game by 10. Why? The Wildcats could not stop Kendra Miller on the ground. He ran for 156 yards in that game. And Kendra Miller has 16 rushing touchdowns on the season. Uh, that's up there. That's got to be top three in the nation. I know Corum has more. There might be one other. Um, when I look at this receiving core, Quinton Johnson and Tay Barber are the go-to guys. They have four receivers with four touchdown catches or more. Not many teams in the nation can say that. And as good as uh, KSU is defensively, I think TCU is just as good when it comes to committing turnovers. TCU isn't a team that's going to keep a game low scoring. Their their defense gives up a lot of points, but what they're good at is causing the opposition to make mistakes. They've forced 14 interceptions in 12 games this year. And for me, I'm going with the better quarterback here, and TCU will win the Big 12 title and advance to the 2022 college football playoff. Yeah, so this one's interesting. It's, again, another rematch, just like the USC-Utah game. TCU was getting creamed in that first game. Uh, if you guys rem remember watching that, uh, they were down 28 to 10 in that game before scoring 28 straight. So this is not a Kansas State team that's bad in any means. They also, uh, I'm pretty sure in that game, Adrian Martinez was already um, out injured in that game. So uh, Will Howard was uh, um, under center. If I, I could be wrong. I, I'm pretty sure that's the first week he played though. Um, yep. but, but yeah, Adrian Martinez still is the more talented of the two. So, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to say he's been bad. But I think he's been average, uh, Will Howard. To go up against someone like Max Duggan when you're average, I don't think that's going to get it done. Uh, if this does go into a shootout, like Andy said, and which I think it, it will, uh, there's only so much Deuce Vaughn can do to help them out. Um, yeah, I, I think there's just too much firepower on, on this TCU team. Kansas State does have a bit of a triple threat. Uh, one player that I um, am going to have my eye on, uh, Malik Knowles. He's one of their wide receivers. He's got 46 catches for 680 yards and two touchdowns. But they also use him uh, in a bit of a Debo Samuel type of way um, with, in the rushing game. He's got 114 yards and three touchdowns also on the ground. And on top of that, he's their return man, and he averages just under 30 yards per kickoff. So uh, in, in a situation where you need every yard you can get uh, to make up for that difference in skill set, uh, better better starting position uh, on the field in, in terms of anytime there's a change of possession, that's a game changer when you have someone like that. So any way that they can help out Will Howard uh, will obviously be, be beneficial to their chances to keep it close if it does go to a shootout. Um, but for me, there, it's just too much uh, firepower on TCU. And you guys mentioned him already, but uh, Kendra Miller is just fantastic to compliment Mr. Max Duggan. He's got 1,260 yards, and he has a rushing touchdown in 13 consecutive games. as the longest streak in the nation. And he's too shy of the all-time record, which is LaDamian Tomlinson in 2000. That is good company to be in. So I'm going with the Horned Frogs here. Uh, moving into 3.30, we have Georgia, number one in the nation, taking on LSU, uh, who fumbled the ball and the game uh, last week. A very bad loss. Andy, we'll start with you. Uh, who's winning this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this one's pretty self-explanatory, fellas. I, <clears throat> hard for me to pick against Georgia in this spot, uh, especially with the way LSU looked last week. 
Uh, obviously, this is a conference championship game. They're going to be up. They're going to have the same thing on their minds that a team like Utah does. Let's go spoil this team season. Uh, I still think Georgia gets in the playoff, even if they lose uh, this game. But it's definitely going to leave a, a, a weird taste in their mouths because um, obviously the way they've been playing all season, they, they're clearly the best team in the SEC. So, you know, they have their eyes set on that championship game. Um, yeah, I, I just I don't see a scenario <laughs> where LSU wins this game, guys. Uh, am I wrong or did is Jaden Daniels a little banged up? So the official note on him is that he his ankle is injured, but Kelly is saying that he will play. So he said that today. Watch. So, so you, so you, so you got to watch for that. Um, if you're on the Georgia side, obviously, he's probably going to be a little bit limited with his mobility, um, not be able to make as many plays with his feet, at least you would hope. I mean, this Georgia defense has been, again, not to the level that they were last year, um, but pretty damn good. Stetson Bennett's having a great year. Um, Lad McConkey's been huge for them uh, as well. Um What's the what's the tight ends that Bowers? Brock Bowers is an absolute freak. Um, yeah, give me the Bulldogs, and I, I don't think it's close. All right, Tom, Andy mentioned your boy there, Brock Bowers, at the end. Uh, I almost had to ask him what his name was. I, I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is Bowers bringing, bringing Georgia uh, to a win here? He just might. Um, but you know what? Don't blame Brian Kelly for the loss against A&M, please. Stop it, guys. Come on. I mean, the guy beat Alabama, and the yeah. – all right, they, they lose to a non-bowl eligible team. Football team is a team game. Look, I, I get it. When you lose, the coach loses. When you win, the team wins. I know how it works, but there's no reason to constantly bash this guy. I'm sick, and I'm tired of it. And you know what? He's in the SEC championship game, his first year as the coach for LSU, where 90% of fans said, oh, he has no shot of making it making it there. They'll be at best a 7-5 and five team and finish some part of the conference. No, you were wrong. You were 100% wrong, folks, when you thought that. Um, he's here. He deserves to be here. Um, but this is the problem. Georgia's defense only gives up 11 points per game. With a banged-up quarterback, I'm not sure it happens, guys. I want it to happen, but I don't think it will. Their running backs are insane. They have three running backs with six or more touchdowns. McIntosh has eight, Edwards has seven, and Milton has six. Georgia is set in their backfield for, like, the next four years. That's how good their running game is. Uh, <clears throat> defensively, I look at Chris Smith and Keely Ringo two future superstars. Jalen Carter's a force to be reckoned with on that defensive line. Opposing teams run away from him. That's why you don't see much logged in his stat sheet. Also, Georgia gets ahead quickly, so teams aren't running the ball as much his way. Uh, and then Nolan Smith, too. I mean, this guy's just outstanding. This guy's just outstanding. You can't pick a team to beat the best team in the nation that just lost to a non-ball eligible team. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not happening. Uh, LSU has some good players. They have the opportunity to cover the 17 and the half point spread, I believe, but we also didn't mention this game's in Atlanta. How does Georgia lose it? How? Bulldogs. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I don't know how Georgia gets away with this, but this is very, very simply put, uh, a glorified home neutral game for them uh, as they seem to get every single time uh, they get into this and then whatever the game is at the beginning of the year, like the Chick-fil-A kickoff game or whatever. Um, those are they're, they're not neutral. They're home games, let's be honest. It's like 50 miles from the from Georgia's campus. Uh, this is a home game for them. So big advantage uh, right off the bat there for the Bulldogs. Georgia is free to lose here. Um, I know we like to say, you know, everyone will be dialed in, um, 100% effort. But I think at, they're so far ahead uh, of everyone else below them. I know Michigan probably looks very good now as an option for number one uh, after that takedown of, of Ohio State. But Georgia's been the most consistent, and everyone knows that if they lose, they're still in. So that's going to be going through some of the players' minds, at the very least, I think. Um, yeah, Jalen Daniels, it's – I mean, thank God he's playing, or else I think this could be an absolute rout. Uh, but like you said, Andy, he might – that mobility might be very, very limited. So obviously Brian Kelly wants to say that he's playing, um, wants to say that he's you know 100% good to go, but I guess we'll see after the first couple of plays, uh, after he takes the first hit uh, to the lower body. Um, but yeah, it, there's just – they're too too consistent. They're too good. Too much talent uh, still on this team. Stetson Bennett uh, is a great leader of this team. I I think talent wise he's not the best, but um, he's got that mentality. The guys know that he's a winner. Obviously they won it last year. Um, and then the X factor Brock Bowers uh, got to get the tight end S some love here uh, for Tom. Forty six catches uh, for a team high six hundred forty five yards. That is a ridiculous stat uh, considering this is a Georgia team that is stacked with wide receivers uh, to be leading as a tight end. Five touchdowns to go along with it. 
also been used effectively in the running game, carrying it six times for almost 100 yards. Most importantly, he's got three touchdowns to go with it. Uh, and then the rest of the receiving core, they've got nine players who have double-digit catches. So if you're LSU uh, in that secondary, I don't know how you defend all these players. So they got the, the guys. Uh, we talked about that. I can't remember which team. I think Alabama two years ago. They were the guys. Uh, that is Georgia, the receiving core this year. So I'm going with the Bulldogs as well. Moving into a game uh, I'll be watching, but probably not many other people. Tulane taking on UCF, our G5 uh, conference championship game of the slate here. <laughs> Home game here for Tulane. It is in New Orleans as AAC rules go. So a bit of an advantage right there for the wave. Andy, is Tulane taking down my UCF Knights? Oh, I'm going to be rooting for you, Brian. I will be rooting for you. Uh, it's going to be a tough task, though, uh, I will say. Okay, here's my question. Who's who's the quarterback? Is it Plumley? Is it Keen? What, what are is, they going with? That is a question no one knows the answer to. Except <laughs> <Chris Malzahn. laughs> um, I mean, if, obviously Plumley, Plumley brings you probably a little bit of better athlete. Like he can, he's going to be able to move around. Obviously, he can run. Um, you know, he's got 11 rushing touchdowns in the year, 13 passing touchdowns. Look at what Keen's been able to do. He's completing 72% of his passes. Uh, his quarterback rating at 159.2. Um, six touchdowns to only one interception on the year. Uh, how about this? Three different guys on the Golden Knights with five receiving touchdowns. O'Keefe, Baker, and Hudson. You've got Isaiah Bowser, who's rushed for 13. Um, your leading rusher is John Reese Pumley with 848. Um, you look at what Tulane's been able to do. They're 10-2. and two. Um, having one of their be better seasons in school history. Um, Pratt has been outstanding for them this year. 2,300 yards, 21 touchdowns to only four interceptions. Um, I don't know. I th this is tough. I give Tulane the slight edge, being that they have the better record and they are going to be at home. Um, can the Knights stop Spears on the ground? 1,177 yards and 14 total touchdowns. Again, two offenses that are explosive. Uh, 496 total yards of offense from the Golden Knights as opposed to the 426 from Tulane. Who's going to win the defensive battle? Who's going to get a stop when they absolutely need it? Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm going Tulane. Oh, man. Uh, Tom, what's your take here? Andy, do you remember what happened last time you picked Tulane when they played UCF earlier this year? Well, I was probably wrong. I don't know. <laughs> ah, okay. right. There's ricochet shot number one of the night. Uh, UCF did win 38-31 at Tulane, might I add, about a month ago. Um, again, we don't know who's starting at quarterback, but if it's Plumley, man, the guy can run too. Uh, 850 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns. I like the combination of R.J. Harvey and Isaiah Bowser. Um, Andy mentioned the wide receivers defensively. Brian, you've got Jason Johnson, who's one of the nation's leaders in tackles. Uh, Trayvon Boris Brash with six sacks, Devon Wilson with three picks. Um, Tulane does present some matchup challenges for you. Uh, Michael Pratt is definitely the superior QB here, regardless of who you throw out there. Also has nine touchdowns on the ground. Um, I do like Shea Wyatt and Deuce Watts for them too against these UCF corners. I think that matchup slightly favors the Green Wave. Uh, Tulane also has two linebackers with over 100 tackles in their own right. Dorian Williams is the player to watch for me. Can he spy on the quarterback and limit the rushing yards for the Golden Knights? Uh, Four sacks, two picks, two forced fumbles for him. Tulane defensively, guys, has forced 11 picks and 10 forced fumbles. That's 21 turnovers they've forced. Um, but at the same time, I I, I want to go with the upset here, and I think I'm going to do it. I mean, UCF found a way at Tulane, so why not again? Why, why not? You know, a couple G5 teams, like, I think UCF has a little bit more grit Tulane might be more talented, but I think UCF is a little more grit, and I think they might want it more, you know? Okay, so <laughs> I kind of – here's the thing. I mostly agree with most of the things that you said. Um, but watching this team, I mean, for the past couple of years, since the Blake Bortle years, we've been known as the Cardiac Knights, we will give everyone and their mothers a heart attack watching games late into the fourth quarter, whether it's because of a shootout or some ridiculous, like, I mean, last week, perfect example, you're down to 1-10 in 10 USF. Uh, you should never, at any point, be losing to a 1-10 in 10 USF and need a ridiculous uh, Sports Center top 10 play to beat them. So that's going to be, you know, my first knock against us. Uh, second knock is that Michael Pratt is actually a pretty good quarterback for Tulane. Uh, in fact, I would say he's been pretty phenomenal in terms of consistency. Maybe not, you know, 
breaking the stat sheets like some of the guys we've had in the past. Uh, but he's got 21 touchdowns and only four interceptions. So he's handling the ball well. Um, but as far as who they're throwing to, I think UCF does have a little bit better of a receiving core. Um, before we saw that tight end touchdown uh, to win the game last week, we saw another ridiculous catch by Javon Baker, who's probably our best wide receiver uh, on the team. He's very quick. He's going to be very hard for Tulane to match up with. And alongside, we have Ryan O'Keefe and Kobe Hudson. All three of those guys have five touchdowns. So we can spread the ball out. But Andy kind of, you know, put the nail in the coffin to um, my trust in the team, and that is who the hell is going to start a quarterback. I genuinely do not know. It should be Mikey Keene. He's got the better arm. He's a more traditional quarterback. But for some reason, Gus thinks that he can, you know, wheel and deal with these sort of strategies that make no sense. Uh, throwing Plumlee in for uh, a quarter and a half at a time, and then Mikey Keene, and then Plumlee comes back for a certain set. And it's just, I, I, I don't know. Personally, I just hate, just pick your quarterback, stick with him. We talked about it in the beginning of the season with McNamara, um, so this McNamara situation in Michigan. They got it sorted, and now look at him. Uh, they're headed to the playoff, so, well, most likely. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think my, my take here is if we start Mikey Keene, he plays the whole game, we win. If not, Plumley, great skill set, very talented, but I don't think he's good enough to, to win us this game. Um, moving into 7.30, team we just talked about, Michigan taking on Purdue. Um, Michigan's been really impressive of late. Uh, Andy, again, we're back to your conference. Purdue likes to play a uh, spoiler quite a bit up there. Uh, are they getting it done here, or is Michigan pulling off this win? Uh, Michigan by a fucking million points. Um, so if, if you're on the Michigan side, what you need to watch out for offensively if you're Purdue, it's two guys. It's it's two. He throws the ball to Charlie Jones and the tight end Payne Durham, and that's it. And then they occasionally mix in Maccabi in the backfield. Um, I'll give them credit for making it there. Um, I'm definitely not still salty about my team choking away their chances <laughs> to be in this game. but. Credit to Purdue for getting there. Brom has had success against top three teams. I think he's either two or three and zero oh in his career at Purdue against uh, teams that are in the top three. Uh, so, I mean, this this by no means is a layover game for Michigan. Like this, this isn't one that you can take lightly. Purdue's going to show up. They're going to be fired up to be there. Um, they can score. Charlie Jones is first team All Big Ten. He's, I mean, him transferring from Iowa was the best decision he's ever made. Because uh, they really, really used him. Uh, he went over 100 yards a ton of times this year. Scored a bunch of touchdowns for them. Uh, Durham, like I mentioned earlier, the tight end. I think he's. I think he can play on Sundays, Tom. I don't know how much Durham tape you've watched. You're, you're our tight end guy, but he is solid. He's a big body in the middle. He can go across the middle and, and make some big plays. And they're going to target him. They're going to need him to. Uh, Mockaby's pretty solid out of the backfield. O'Connell's been there for a million years. Um, and, you know, he knows the Brom offense pretty well. Uh, on the Michigan side, I mentioned earlier in the show, no Blake Corum for the rest of the year. Um, didn't seem to hurt him too much with Donovan Edwards last week, going for 200-plus. Um, it's almost like they have three all first-team All-Big Ten offensive linemen uh, on the roster. McCarthy was looked great for you know with the shit that I talked to shit that I talked about him uh, on the show last week before uh, coming off a couple shaky performances. I see no reason that Michigan loses this game, guys. Um, I th they're the better offense, defense, just, I mean, their kicker, Jake Moody, is awesome. Um, g give me the Wolverines here. All right, Tom. And O'Connell, who has been there for four years, Andy, has the option to return next year yeah. to exercise the COVID year if he wants. So we may be talking about him again. Yeah. Um, that would be interesting. But, yeah, he has been there for a while. He's, he's pretty much been a starter since the back end of his freshman year. Um, that Michigan defense, though, is scary, right? You talked about Charlie Jones, Payne Durham. Uh, those two combined for 20 touchdowns, but they have nothing else. And you know the Wolverines defense will be keying in on those guys. Now, has Purdue impressed lately? Yes, they've won three straight, but they also owe losses to Syracuse, who fell off the second half of the season, Wisconsin, who fired their head coach, Iowa, who has a clipboard quarterback, and Penn State. So uh, those are three Three of those are, are bad losses, in my opinion, for Purdue to, to be here in this game. Uh, defensively, I do like Jack Sullivan for them. He's a solid defensive end. And Cam Allen, three picks in the secondary. But we talked about it before. J.J. McCarthy has played so well. His uh, field vision is incredible. Um, Donovan Edwards, he's no Blake Corum. But, guys, he, he averages seven and a half yards per carry. Seven and a half. You know why? Because he's learned behind an outstanding running back who's been there for a while. And what's even better 
is that they're not game planning for Donovan Edwards because they know McCarthy is actually a threat to throw the football, unlike Cade McNamara. Isn't it great to have a quarterback that can throw the football? Um, also, Cor- Cornelius Johnson and Ronnie Bell are, are big targets for them. Junior Colson and Michael Barrett are insane linebackers that lead that defense. Um, I, I know the game's in, in Indiana, but Purdue has no shot, guys. Purdue has no shot. Michigan. Yeah, so, I mean, the one thing that I mean, I, I just talked about during the UCF is settling on a quarterback. They've done that, and McCarthy has been pretty good. Um, but he just came off probably his worst game in terms of accuracy. He threw some balls that were definitely not intelligent throws, as I'll put it. Uh, ended up 12 for 24. But this Purdue team is not as good on defense as Ohio State. So I don't think uh, these Michigan fans need to hold their breath that that's going to happen again. Obviously, losing Blake Corum for the season very harsh um it's a lot of production to lose um but andy said donovan edwards has been a fantastic replacement he went right in he's picking up where quorum left off uh the one thing that purdue has most here <clears throat> is the fact that they have played spoiler so far that's how they've got the moniker the spoiler makers um a note that i saw earlier on espn uh tweeted out purdue is three 0 versus top three teams under jeff rom when they're unranked those three games all in the last couple of years two were last year. They defeated number two Ohio State 49 to 20 in 2018. Then last year, they went ahead and beat number two Iowa 24 to 7. Then they went ahead and beat number three Michigan State by 11 points. So they thrive in this role of spoiler maker. And you probably thought I was maybe going to pick them, but I'm not uh, because this Michigan team has just been too solid. Uh, the team I love to hate, but I, I love the way they're playing right now. Andy, you mentioned them only throwing to one guy. Um, Purdue, I'm talking about. Uh, but we've seen that before with David Bell just last season, and he couldn't be stopped. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe that gives Purdue a chance to keep it a little close, and we get some some, uh, some fireworks around like halftime-ish. But I think Michigan is just too powerful, and they're going to pull away here. I mean, we just watched them keep Ohio State uh, pretty much locked in entirely. Uh, they had 35% third down conversion rate last week, and that's a good offense that they kept to that uh, four seed Stroud into two interceptions. So for me, Michigan has just been t- too good. I-, I can't really fault them too much on on anywhere. I, I see not many holes. So I'm going with Michigan as well. Then our last game here, we have UNC taking on Clemson, the team that we have all loved to hate this season. Uh, Andy, who's winning this one? Uh, what a fucking snooze fest. <laughs> um, so, I mean, North Carolina, what, they're on a two-game losing streak. Clemson coming off that rough loss to South Carolina. These are both, these are two teams coming into this game with bad taste in their mouth, right? What a better way to fix it than winning the conference championship game. I don't I don't see how North Carolina wins this game. They're they're coming off a loss to NC State, who's been garbage down the stretch of this season, albeit they lost Leary, who arguably you could, is top what, two, three quarterback in the in the ACC. Um you have Drake May who's been spinning it. He's had a great year for for Carolina once again, ob- obligatory. Their defense can't stop a fucking nosebleed. Uh you have to mention that every time on the show. Uh, DJ Ugalele, what DJ are we going to get uh, in this cha- in this championship game? Is he going to show up? Is he going to you know make some mistakes? Because he is prone to fumbles, to these interceptions, these turnovers, these mistakes when they absolutely don't need them. Uh, I-, I look for Clemson to get Shipley going. I look f- look for them to get pressure on Drake May, try to make his life uh, pretty difficult Saturday night. Uh, but I'm taking Clemson. I-, I think this one's pretty easy, folks. Uh, I just don't see a way that North Carolina wins this game. All right, Tom. I hate DJ Ukulele. I, I absolutely can't stand this guy. You know, and he's only a junior, too. I'm sick and tired of hearing his name. Uh, ever since 2020 on one of my first shows, guys, you remember, there's constant, like, uh, Andy went off on a rant on him on Review and Preview as well. And, but the, here, here's the problem. You know, we can say how much we don't like this guy, but UNC doesn't play defense. Clemson only gives up 20 points per game. You know, there's three different phases to a football team. It's not just the offense, right? UNC might have a good, might have the better passing attack, but Clemson has the better run game. They have the better offensive line. They have the better defense all around. And yeah, they have the better special teams too. Hell, Mac, that, that, Mac Brown, <laughs> there was a lot of confusion at the end of that NC State game. You lose to NC State without Devin Leary, that is a problem. Uh, Will Shipley is a force. 14 touchdowns on the season. He looks really, really good. Um, I like Antonio Williams, Davis Allen, Bo Collins, and Jake Brenningstoll. I mean, Hell, if you have two tight ends on your roster that each have four touchdowns, you're doing something right, even if it's a carbon quarterback. Uh, 
I, I really like Jeremiah Trotter Jr. as well. You know, he's starting to play like his father a little bit. Um, you know, he's looking really good out there, and they still have Miles Murphy, who leads the team in sacks. Uh, they have a good defensive tackle in Tyler Davis, and I think it's going to cause some problems for Drake May. You might see Drake May trying to run a little bit more often than he does. Now, granted, he does have six rushing touchdowns and over 600 rushing yards on the year, but how far can that get you against a really stout defense like Clemson? Uh, especially this UNC offense, uh, it is really good, but I, I just – when, when a good offense meets a good defense, what usually happens? The good defense usually gets the advantage, right? Because you're, you're the defense, you have to react. If you're the offense, you have to act. Um, you know, so it's easier to defend than attack sometimes. That's just how, how, how it is. UNC, the only notable player on their defense is Storm Duck. Um, oh, you know, like that, that, that's really the only guy that I can. I know Cedric Gray is 130 tackles, but um, Storm Duck has been really good this year. Ten passes, defended three tackles. He'll be matched up against Antonio Williams. That's probably the matchup of this game, but Clemson's favored by seven and a half. I'm going with the Tigers here. Yeah, so this is an in- interesting one in terms of the way Vegas is looking at it. Um, I think, I mean, like Andy said, a bit of a snoozer here. So that plus seven and a half, I might just take it because apparently they see this going to a shootout. Yes, yeah, seven and a half, but they think this over-under is going to be even higher than the games we talked about earlier. Uh, in the TCU Kansas State game because it's at 63 and a half, so they really trust Drake May's talent here to at least keep it close. Um, Andy, you said this defense can't stop a nosebleed on UNC, but I would argue that DJ Ugalele is a worse QB than a nosebleed would be. That's how bad this guy is. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not entirely counting out North Carolina here. Yeah, they've had some bad losses, but they're kind of that's kind of how they were last year um, under How they can score a ton of points. The defense isn't there. They don't have Hal anymore, but Drake May, I scouts love this guy. Uh, they think he might be a future number one pick. I mean, I've watched a few of their games. He's certainly got the talent, and they returned Josh Downs at wide receiver, so I mean, Clemson does have a really good D-line. Um, is May going to be able to scramble away from it? I mean, Bracey's been really good this year. I think we talked about it last week. There's NFL talent all over that D-line, so they're going to put a lot of pressure on May, but I don't know. It, I think it'll be close. I think Clemson wins it, but Man, I, th- I think this is going to be yeah, – I, th- I thought about switching there last second, but no, I'm, I'm going with the Tigers. Um, but I will take back – I just talked myself into this not being a snooze fest because I think uh, May and Downs can uh, pull up a little little something to make this close. So We also – we all just talk shit about Ugulele. That means he's about to have the game of his life on Saturday. It happens every time. <laughs> the gotta, we, we have a whole other year to talk about this guy, too. It just sucks. <laughs> Uh, why couldn't he have transferred to Iowa so he could have just... Dude, what? I mean, no, watch. <laughs> He's going to transfer this offseason. Klubnik's going to be their starter next year. That's my bold prediction. Ooh. They're going to Kelly Bryant his ass. I like it. I like it. Um, all right. That, that's going to wrap up our show. Uh, enjoy the conference championship games, even if your team is not in this week. You can root for uh, your rival to lose. Um, hit the like, subscribe down below if you can. We love it. Andy and Tom's links to their shows, all their social media is also down below. Uh, all the links in the description. We'll see everybody next week for the uh, college playoff. Talk a little bit of bowl uh, game action. Um, So enjoy the games and see you next week.